Hi. Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very warm welcome. I would like to welcome you all tonight to the second of the Bus and Coach Forum's annual debates. Now, tonight we're going to hear from two of the arguably most eminent people in the UK bus industry, and we're delighted they've both been kind enough to join us this evening. I'm going to invite my friend Lee White, the Vice Chairman of the Bus and Coach Forum, to actually introduce him formally. So without any further ado, I invite Lee to come forward and make the introduction. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our first speaker this evening is Roger French. Um, Roger is obviously very well known to yourselves, um, who have been in the industry for a number of years. Um, we'd love to hear what you've got to say this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Roger French. Thank you. Now, in the next 20 minutes, there's going to be two broad themes to, to the observations I want to make. Firstly, we're pretty good as an industry at dealing with the big stuff. But we're not so good at dealing with detail. But I put it to you, we've got to get better at doing the detail because of a big change that is hitting us right in our eyes now and coming towards us fast. So much has been thrown at our industry over the last 50 years. Don't worry about reading all that. That's just a, some of the things, it's societal change, financial ups and downs, the boom and bust economies, legislative changes, regulatory bodies. We just knuckle down and we get on with it. And if you look over the last uh, 50 years, pretty much every decade, we've done stuff to counter what has been thrown at us. So we in the 60s, we got costs out with one-man operation in the 70s. We sort of found out this word market for the first time. In the 80s, we adapted to uh, getting rid of regulation, allegedly it was uh, regulation getting rid of. Uh, we then re thought we should get back to the market again and we got low floor buses, all, all these sorts of things we did to adapt to what, had, what has been thrown at us over the last 50 years. But what it, what it boils down to, though, is that basically not a lot has changed over 150, 160 years. We're still running scheduled services from A to B, picking up passengers at bus stops, dropping them off further along the line of route on frequent bus routes, just as George Shillabeer and Thomas Tilling did all those years ago. That's why the basics, getting the basics right, just as George and Thomas never known them, I don't know why I'm being familiar and calling them by their first names, just as they would have done all, all, all those years ago. Now, I want to just spend a little bit about the detail, because I do feel passionate about it, because I think it, it, pitch, it, it, it brings to a head the problem our industry faces. We all think it's a fantastic industry we work in, and it is, but opinion formers don't always share that view. And maybe it's because we don't, we're not honest with ourselves about how things really are at the sharp end. For the last six months since I've retired, I've been all over to every part of the country, up and down, north, south, east and west. And I reckon the industry is in good shape. But it could do a whole lot better. To quote, misquote the opposition leader, the British bus industry can do better than this. Overall, it's average, but my belief is, without much effort, it could really be excellent. The 80-20 rule applies. 80% is mediocre, average. Of the remaining 20%, 10% is brilliant, best in class, really has the wow factor, can't wait to travel again. The other 10% is, frankly, absolutely appalling disgraceful, can't wait to get off the bus, never get on that bus again. And it only needs a few tweaks, it's not big, that we could move from those appalling to average and from average to excellence. Now if you think I'm being unfair with my mediocrity tag, I urge you, put your smartphones and tablets down, stop sending emails and texts, forget the budgets, the KPIs, the spreadsheets, the dashboards, the meetings, and get out there. There are far too many examples around the country of a complete lack of attention to detail, as though no one with any responsibility or interest is looking 
at how things actually are at bus stops, bus stations, onboard vehicles, or the actual service quality. It will be like the supermarket manager never coming out of his office and going on the shop floor to see the missing shelf labels, the wrongly priced labels, the dirty aisles, the missing products, the lack of baskets, the queue at the one checkout that's opened. We're very good at talking the talk. We're not very good at walking the walk in our industry. The gushing, glossy, cheesy press releases which herald investment in new buses, which after all are only replacing life expired buses in many cases we'd have to do anyway. Customers would appreciate more emphasis on attention to detail and get the basics right rather than these glossy launches in front of the camera. These only emphasise to our customers the disconnect that is out there between our glossy PR and reality on the streets. Let's take a look at a, just a small selection of my horror file of photographs that have been collected over the last few months. The main departure point outside York Station, a major tourist attraction. And this is, these are the main bus stops in, near Carnarvon, another tourist spot. Personally, I'd rather be... <laughs> I'd rather be confused in Bridge End than not have any information at all. This is a timetable case in a Leicester suburb. No wonder the residents are fed up. Because, do you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I took that photograph in July 2012. I went back there this July, and the same thing is still there. It has been changed now because I mentioned it to a young bus manager who's gone to Arriva, and within a day, he had it changed. <coughs> What's wrong with Wednesdays in Newcastle? <laughs> Why do we need to emphasise the negative all the time? And it's no better on board buses. You, you travel on buses to see out of them, otherwise we might as well have vans. <laughs> Attractive liveries. But if you use contravision to see the beautiful sight as you cross the River Humber, well, what's the point in it? And it's, in, it's right by the best seat on the bus. Well, cove panels that don't stick. And those that are posted, any old how. They create such a poor image. And why is it we're obsessed with incontinence? <laughs> we truly are incontinence, chlamydia, <laughs> domestic violence, drug abuse, child abuse. It, it's just, the social deprivation just goes on. And some managers haven't realised that modern new buses don't have cove panels anymore, but they haven't told the bill stickers, they end up on the roof. You can't read them. Just as well, probably, frankly. <laughs> and the comfort of our passengers seems to take a back seat, or in this case, the front seat. No one's given any consideration to me who took an hour to sit on that bus from Manchester to Bolton. Luckily, no one was sitting next to me. If we aspire to be compared to the best-in-class retailers, we've got to get much better at this. We've really got to get our act together at the de sorting out the detail in the way our services are presented and sold. To use the perennial comparison, it's not rocket science. It just is it's pretty easy compared to the big stuff we deal with, pretty good at. Tell you what, before you put your tablets or your smartphones down, have a look at the major companies' websites. Here's a technology that's been around now for the best part of 15 years. And I'll say this in the kindest way possible. The websites of the three major groups representing over half the country's buses, frankly, are a complete headache to use. You need to know the answer to the question before you can know the answer. Norman Baker passed on the feedback to us many times that we're letting young people down. We're making it off-putting to travel by bus. This is the these are the customers of the future. We're not taking advantage of the commercial opportunities this market presents to us. A market that's mobile by its very nature, has limited income, face has huge leisure time, embraces new technology, we should be falling over ourselves to be, by offering attractive incentives, special deals, loyalty schemes, and making it easy to find out about them online. Unless you're a student, and then it's hard, none of the three major groups offer anything at all that looks interesting to young people on their websites. 
with the recent and notable and very welcome exception of Stagecoach Northeast with their VIP card, a fantastic blueprint for the industry for the future. Now all this is important because we're on the cusp of another big structural societal change, not actually on the cusp, we're, we're moving into it, but we're not ready for it. I put it to you, we're not geared up, and it's rather like the deregulation in the mid 80s. We weren't ready for that, and we had to restructure and have some honest self soul searching as to what we were gonna do with it. And as I pass the bot baton on, I put it to you, we need to do the same again now. I'm referring to how new technology is impacting the way our customers pay for products and services and how we communicate with our customers. We need to wake up and smell the wave and pay and the Twitter feed. If we can't sort out our websites to make them friendly to use, nor have the imagination to offer encouraging deals to young people, how the hell are we gonna take advantage of the new payment methods now sweeping through retail and available to us? If we can't get attractive sales messages displayed inside our buses, how are we going to encourage customers through attractive and enticing social media messages? Once our passengers begin using as they are, their bank cards that MasterCard, Visa and the banks are now distributing fast, they use them in shops to just wave and pay, there will be a built up, pent up need to use them on buses as well. A need for us too. Because by getting our customers to use those wave and pay cards will give us, through clever software, valuable information about our customers. So Terry Leahy described the introduction of the Tesco Club card as the complete revolution for the company. Suddenly, as never before, Tesco could see who their customers were, where they shopped, what they purchased, how often, and it unleashed a whole new era in customer relationships, sending money off vouchers and enticing visits to the store. Our industry needs to grasp this potential with open arms, but, we will, but will we have the decision-making structures to go with it? The people with the necessary skills, enterprise and passion in the right place to take advantage of the amazing opportunities it offers by making timely and informed decisions. The bus business is a local business. Our markets are local. That's why in the mid 80s, government was so keen to break up the larger subsidiaries of NBC into smaller units, mainly because they wanted local contestable markets. But NBC directors realized in any event and had already begun splitting up companies such as Western National, Bristol, Southdown, Midland Red to get managers down and in tune with local markets. I don't think it's any coincidence that now, as we move into this new era of customer relationships, the star performing award-winning companies are Reading, Notting Nottingham, Lothian and Trent Barton, all renowned for their local autonomy and are run by leaders with passion in abundance and a commitment to the local market. Not only does this prove a huge help in developing relationships with local stakeholders, especially when in an era when meaningful partnerships at local level are so important, but also with the need to have managers of the right status able to take decisions at local level affecting pricing and service levels. Managers in tune with local markets, able to take risks and make decisions based on gut reactions is an important attribute which needs encouraging. The initiatives I was able to try at Brighton Hove were determined and pursued locally. Trying out hunches that would never have stood up to scrutiny had a full-blown business case been required and pondered over for weeks at group level. The new era of electronic payments through wave and pay and smartphone payments will give us more data than we can ever have dreamt of having about each passenger, who they are, how much they travel, how often, when and where. The era of emails, of texts and tweets means we can communicate with those passengers at virtually no marketing costs. The opportunities are huge. We can price personally Encourage greater use of buses for lapsed travellers, reward loyalty, entice leisure trips, suggest taking friends or families for extra trips. The potential is mind-blowingly vast. Not use the bus for a few weeks? Here's a bespoke offer to tempt you back. Age 20 and on limited income? Here's a different deal to if you're age 40 and comfortably off. But 
As they say in all good docu-soaps these days, there's a problem. Who's going to analyse the data and make the recommendations? Who's going to make sure we don't drown in the data overload and can see the key pieces of information? Who's going to send out the emails and texts with their professionally written tempting scripts to encourage extra revenue? Who's going to make the decisions on pricing and where they're going to be based? Who will they report to and how will they relate to local autonomy and initiatives? At all costs, we don't want to stifle local initiatives, yet the skills needed, never mind the economies of scale from this data management problem, points towards a centralised specialist function. It won't be good enough to have average presentation, and certainly not slapdash presentation, as illustrated earlier when sending out email marketing to customers. So Terry Leahy's Tesco model doesn't have local Tesco store managers sending out vouchers to the customers within the geographic area of that store. Yet in our ideal model for a bus company structures, our locally based managing directors, the local Mr or Mrs bus company if you will, with a commensurate status, able to smooch with local authority chief executives, understand the politics of the leader or the directly elected mayor, pretty pertinent in Liverpool at the moment, know the editor of the local paper and all the other worthies who are movers and shakers in the region. Ideally, that same manager would retain responsibility for revenue growth and understanding the local market. Wise bus company owners want their managing directors to be passionate, innovative and use their gut feeling to drive the company forward. This means being bold with pricing initiatives. But decision making based on gut feeling doesn't sit happily alongside the availability of mountains of scientific data. There are two competing trends. As more sophisticated software takes over, that it makes sense for there to be some centralization of the specialization of data management and inter its interpretation. But there's also the need, more than ever before, for greater localism and experienced managers of the right status to liaise with the key stakeholders locally. Companies who get this balance right will be the award winners and the success stories of the future. If the Reddings, Nottinghams, Lothians and Trent Bartons can do it, then there's no reason why the groups can't do so. But local MDs must have the autonomy and the power. They must have the buttons to press when they feel the time is right. It's no good giving them a dashboard of KPIs, but no ability to press the button when they think the button needs to be pressed. They can't be in a queue for group contracted software development, unable to change websites until four weeks notice has been given, having to wait for their turn for a group resource to send an email out. Such frustrations, which you might gather are personal ones, and inefficiencies completely fly in the face of the justification for getting managers down to local level ready for 1986. Using new technology must not push us back to the bad old days of corporatization. A final observation for the future. Developments such as Gold, Sapphire, Hyperlink and other first brands are to be welcomed. But why oh why is it taking so long to roll out these quality initiatives nationwide? If the concept of raising the bar works in place A and place B, then let's get on and roll out these truly quality product initiatives quicker without endless research as one group does. If drivers wearing a special tie to show they've had an extra day's training and a different coloured floor and seats is what's needed, then let's get on and roll it out everywhere. Can you imagine Marks and Spencer changing over to the Your m and branding with store refits at the slow pace we work at? Similarly, with the advance of technology, why are we always so behind the curve, as they say, on pursuing these trends? Real-time information has been around for over a decade, yet there are still too few bus stops displaying it and still too even more few displaying accurate real-time information. The main preoccupation of passengers on public transport now is using smartphones. It's with us now. And yet, we're way behind in exploiting Wi-Fi and apps. Key to this future vision will be getting local managers, getting the basics right, 
as well as getting ahead of the techie curve, getting all the basics right, at the bus stop, at the bus station, on the bus, on the website, on the Twitter feed, on the app, answering the phone, interacting with local stakeholders, and groups ensuring companies of manageable sizes relating to local areas have managers with autonomy to take decisions on service levels and pricing based on a mix of gut feeling and advice from data management expertise, and above all, imbibed with motivation and passion in abundance. As I see a new generation of young bus managers who have been brought up with new technology and understand its potential, I'm confident that in passing the baton on, the huge opportunities ahead will be, will be grasped and the industry will prosper as never before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Uh, much thought for the three gentlemen at the front and the rest of the audience, I guess. We'll now move on. Um, so Brian, I guess, needs no introduction, um, but very clearly well known for his leadership of Stagecoach um, and indeed Sue to Holdings and his charitable activities that I'm sure you're aware of. Now the chairman of Stagecoach Group um, from earlier this year. Um, so Brian needs no introduction, I guess. Uh, so Brian, thank you. I'm going to do my presentation slightly differently in the sense that I, I, I'm going to make a pitch for you to employ me to the three young guys at the front here because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. <laughs> so um, and I think my first pitch would be, um, would be to say, I, I hope you would employ me because of my experience. And my experience goes back some way, actually not quite as long as Roger. Um, I think I've been on the buses 41 years. Um, and I remember um, not long after I started in Scotland on the buses, there was an incident that happened on a bus in Fife. And I'll just explain this to you quickly. That was a fleet liner and you were, they, they wouldn't put the rods into the driver's cab. And so you had to go upstairs and open up the front and bend down and turn the numbers and turn the thing, you see? So anyway, this apparently is because the Scottish bus wouldn't spend £17 to bring the <laughs> rods into the car. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a true story. There was a miners' bus in Fife, and in the 70s, the ladies wore miniskirts, and there was a conductress on the bus, and as she bent down to turn the destination wing, a miner pinched her bottom. <laughs> And we were all on strike for eight weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most expensive pleasure that the man took. <laughs> and that, that was the industry that I was introduced to. But I made a few observations as a result of that. First of all, that industrial relations were shocking. And also an observation that, because I guess they say any young man that's not a socialist has no courage. And any old man that is a socialist is a fool. And I probably fit that category quite well, actually. And I used to think at that time, why, if I work for the state, I'm on strike all the time? What's the point of striking if I own the buses, you know? <laughs> and it was this sort of anomaly. I, I could never quite understand how that was working, you know? And so it was an interesting time to start in an industry, an industry that was, that was divided in many ways. And, and when I went to work in Glasgow, I think this story sums it all up, actually, because driver came in and shouted my name to go out on a duty and as we're walking out through the garage it was an older man and they, they liked doing mentoring these older men on the buses you know and he said to well what will we do the day son uh, will we run early or will we run late <laughs> so I just think of it that way but I said well could we not just run to time <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 he says you didn't understand <laughs> you see it's like this Either we run early and we make them all miss the bus, or we run late and we make them all wait for us. You know, the one option with the customers was not to actually do it in time. And we went to war with our customers every day. So that was the industry that I started in as an 18 year old. And it was great fun and I loved it, but there was an awful lot of things that didn't add up. So I would say to you that I've had a lot of experience. I've stood in the picket lines myself and uh, that's uh, been an interesting experience. 
And I think some of these experiences seem like they're just history and they're not important, but actually, if you store away some of the information that you gather in your PC as you go along, it can actually be useful in the future, especially if you've got an industrial relations issue you're trying to deal with, or even when you're putting new products in the market. And I'll give you an example. We started a sleeper coach, as you know, and we put these new sleepers in the market, and we went, we looked at doing Aberdeen and Dundee and Perth and doing a direct service to these cities, which actually was done in the 70s by the Scottish Bus Group. And I remember that at that time, that service was busier than the Edinburgh service. It was an incredibly busy service. And going back to providing times for these towns at that time, been absolutely amazing. That's actually now become the busiest service. So I think that experience can be useful and I'd hope I would be able to be useful to you with some of that experience that I've got. So I, ho I hope that would be the first reason for giving my job. Second reason is I like to put my credentials forward as an innovator. Um, identifying new products I think is very, impo very important uh, going forward. And Martin said an interesting thing to me uh, the other day. He said, you know, we, we talk about why Stagecoach is, is a bit different and it's a bit more profitable and so forth. He said, but actually there's a good reason for it. He says, we've spent many years putting interurban products into our provincial companies, and these interurban products have all got very high margins on them. And he said, you put that in tandem with a good local bus service, and you get extra good profits. And I think that, that you know, we look at the innovation we've introduced over the years. We went back to our express routes with Megabus, and we did Megabus Plus, which fed everyone into the railway line, which actually been very successful. I just wish we'd, we could do more of. Um, we did mega train and applied the same principles. And the reason why we're doing this is that more and more sales have been made on the internet with our uh, uni rider tickets, our weekly tickets. And you know, if you look at the retail sales, every time you hear the retail sales, the internet's the part that's growing and the high street's the part that's shrinking. And so the same thing applies of course, to the bus companies, and so we've got to be there and be providing that. And then we developed the gold product as well, which I know we've had luxury products before, but to actually go to first class style seating. I think our marketing's uh, uh, also been interesting. We, 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 we do this direct telesales. Uh, we know we're phoning, we buy the information, we know who we're phoning. We're, we're offering people a weekly ticket for free to get them to travel on the buses. Uh, of course, everything that Roger says is absolutely right. We should be putting Wi-Fi on every bus. Totally convinced about that. Uh, we used to start it on the, on the Oxford Tube, and people used to follow the bus in their cars and download <laughs> all their emails. <laughs> when I started on the buses, people used to cycle behind the bus to get the draft, so they'd cycle along the road. So things do change, and we've got to be a bit smarter. And the other thing is that when I started on the buses, I used to plead with the, the inspectors in East Cobride to let me answer the phones. Because uh, we didn't answer the phones at that. <laughs> it seems ridiculous, you know. I was speaking to Martin Sutton about this at Oxford, and he was saying, you know, Brian, do you remember when we had these conversations 30 years ago, and we were arguing about whether we should answer the phone or not? And I said, I remember it very well. In fact, I remember volunteering to answer the phone. And people would say, when you answer the phone, they would say, oh, I didn't think you would you would answer, and you felt like saying, well, why did you phone, you know? But, but, but actually, they phoned the bus company in, in the hope that someone would speak to them. And I had a pet thing about phones, so when we started Stagecoach Express, we used to answer the phones 24 hours a day, and we used to answer them through the night. So people would phone you from a party, it was seven pound a ticket, so I was happy to take the call. They'd phone you at three o'clock in the morning, they're obviously steaming at a party, and they go, why don't you go to <laughs> London in the morning, you know? And I said, it's no problem, sir, we can accommodate you, you know? And after we did this for seven years, we were really, really exhausted. And my brother, <laughs> my, bro my brother, who's the Church of Scotland minister, said, well, I'm not surprised you're tired. He says, deprived sleep is the most effective form of torture. The British police have been using it effectively for many years and you've been doing it to yourselves for seven years. No wonder you're tired. But phones are so important and phones are going to continue to be important. And, and Martin Sutton said to me, you know, in 20 years time, the young people in our industry are going to look back and say, do you remember these ridiculous conversations we had about whether we should engage with our customers on Twitter or not? And he's absolutely right in that. And we have to get up the learning curve and catch up with you guys in that. But we get the message and we understand that it's really important to engage 
and to deliver on that. So I would say that that I hope as an innovator, I would still have something to offer you. Um, I've still people have come up with some new ideas. I started a bus company in Poland two years ago, and uh, it's just going gangbusters. Just to identify the right market, and uh, I would hope that if you gave me a job, I could identify some new areas of business for you. Uh, that I could, uh, that we could start some new products and still come up with new ideas to deliver further passenger growth. I hope I'm not only an innovator, but I hope I'm a motivator as well. And uh, slightly, slightly, just want to put the stagecoach angle back here a wee bit, Roger. You know, uh, yes, we do have the discipline of a of a large group. We do have the discipline of central procurement because it's money you gave away for nothing at Go Ahead, and that's fine, because we want to take all of that, right, okay? But the key issue, I think, is having a short chain of command. And I think what happens is you can mushroom very quickly into a, a multiplicity, and the worst thing you want to avoid, the main thing to avoid, is people that are not in the line of management, but have got responsibility, not actually responsibility, they just have a say in things. So you get these people who have not actually got any line responsibility, but they can tell you what to do. And that's what you have to avoid at all costs. So at Stagecoach, we've kept a very short chain of command. I think that's been very successful as a strategy. And we have broken our big companies up into smaller companies. And that's also been highly successful. And our managers were uneasy about that first, but they now all, all endorse it. And I do think it's important as a motivator to take responsibility for problems and to be willing to assess and take risk. And I actually think that it's good to be challenged by someone from head office, as long as that person isn't going to dump on you and blame you when everything goes wrong. What you want is that person from head office to come and challenge you intellectually about what you're doing and then stand beside you once you've made the agreement and know that if it doesn't work then, so what? We tried it. The biggest thing, mistake you can make is not to try. So what we want to do is encourage a risk-taking environment and encourage you to do new things, encourage you to take risks, promise that we won't dump on you if you get it wrong. And so I think that's a really important cultural thing you want to embed in your company, regardless of how big it is. And I also think as a motivator, it's important to have fun because life's very short and we have a lot of fun at Stagecoach. And, and if you can't enjoy it, then you should really pack up your bags and go home. And like. I like launching new things because I think it's exciting. And I remember when we launched Polsky Bus, we didn't quite understand. So we're not as good in this internet stuff as, as Roger is. And, and we opened the website at a particular time. And we got a half of 1% of the population of Poland try to go on the website at one point. <laughs> as you can imagine what happened, the website sank. And then the guy that does it, it's just somebody that does it from his back room in Edinburgh, because I wouldn't pay anybody the right money to do it. <laughs> and, and this guy, it's called Sri, and he's very nice. He's an Indian from Stornoway. And at one point, <laughs> like some real problems with, were worried about succession, because he started off the Megabus thing. We've now moved to a more corporate structure for that. But anyway, as part of my trying to help him, I invited him to a meeting in Perth, and I said to him, it was that terrible winter, and I said, OK, Sri, you've just come out of your house, it's a terrible morning, you've slipped, and you've gone under a Lothian bus, and you're dead. I'm at your funeral, and I'm, I'm, tears are streaming down my face, because I think you're a great guy, and I'm really, really upset about it. And this is the question, Sri, what happens to your business the next day? And he said, well, first of all, I'm really, really careful on the pavements. <laughs> <laughs> Shri, that's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> so Shri forgot that the polls are an hour ahead of us, and he didn't switch the device on that allows you to make ticket sales, right? And then when he switched it on, the polls all went home, so we'd know we are selling tickets, and we've got... <laughs> Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on our website, so the only thing we could do is give the tickets away, right? And so the sales just went like that, because we got the site up and running again, and, the, and we just watched the sales climb as it, as it went on Twitter and all the rest of it, Facebook, as free tickets everywhere in Poland. And then at 8 o'clock, the site just completely imploded with the numbers on it, and we had to put a sign up saying, come back tomorrow morning uh, due to demand, you know? So, you know... What do you do? It's to, I actually agree with Roger about this. Do you just do it? Or do you spend all your time doing papers about it? Just do it, right? So give me a job, because mm -hmm. I'll encourage you just to do it. But as long as, you're, as you've got nerves of steel and you don't mind coming along with me on it, because it could be a pretty scary trip at times. 
And finally, I think you're looking for someone in your job that's a visionary, and we're supposed to talk about 2035. And I would say this, historical trends continue for the foreseeable future unless something fundamental happens to change them. That's a really, really important issue, hey? And I, I kind of worked out um, towards the end of the 90s that something fundamental was changing across the whole of the bus industry. So I did some market research, and the market research, to your point, it was gut feel, but I did the market research to confirm that what I thought was right. And what, when I got the market research, I was gobsmacked because it told me a whole lot of other things as well. And it said that we should be doing partnership with people that lag your loft and deliver food locally and grow food locally. And, 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 and it said that 64% of our customers felt they should be traveling using the car less, right? It was just an amazing set of results that we got. And it said that, that life had changed, environmental issues become very important for people. So we need to change our product to match that. That's how we developed the biobus in Kilmarnock, which is not the center of the eco-universe, I know. But um, that was an exciting project as well, where we, where, we, where we actually worked out you can make this stuff from recycled chip fat, you know, so in from Lanarkshire, we're right in the core of the raw <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that was, that was great for us. You could, could even make it from dead whales, where people deliver dead whales from Stornoway at the factory and all the rest of it, right? <laughs> but what we discovered was that people that travel on a bus is actually highly sensitive about this, and you're not prepared to park your car in the drive if the bus has got a rotten carbon footprint. So we learned all this. The other thing we learned, I'm sorry, I know the TFL bus people, I know you all hate cyclists, because I've had these private conversations with some of your leaders, and I know how they feel about cyclists when they're being honest, right? But I had to make across to our people that we had to start to love cyclists, right? Because we hated cyclists. Because it used to be if you knocked them down, they were on, just on welfare. And now you knock them down, they're on half a million a year, and you've got a great big insurance claim, right? And then the other thing, was, you know, and they look so good on their bikes with these lycra pants, you know? And I used to have this, I used to have this information from Boston University that said that there's only two types of serious cyclists. Ones that are impotent already because they've been sat in these saddles, <laughs> and ones that are going to be impotent as they keep cycling in this fanatical way that they are. Right? And the old bus men used to love this stuff when I said it because they said they look great in their lycra like pants, but it ain't always all working, right? <laughs> but I have to tell you guys, we've got to love the cyclists because our research said that these are the people that are chaining their bikes outside their stations and they want to use buses as well as trains, and they're also, in their lifestyle, very discerning about the environment, and so we have to change our views about things. So I would ask you to give me the job, because I believe identifying the tra changing trends are the absolute key to driving your business. And if you can work out what these changing trends are, and you can capitalize on it, you can lead the market, and you can do some really exciting things. I absolutely agree about the young people thing, but it's not easy for us old bus men, right? I mean, when I started as a bus conductor, the age was 14 for a fare, right? So if they had a moustache, you'd say, <laughs> oh, you no doubt you'll tell me you're an early developer, you know, <laughs> come on and get the full fare out. But of course, now they're at school, they're about 25, so what do you do? <laughs> we need to rethink this. Martin is very charged by this at Stagecoach. I think you'll see some interesting products coming out of Stagecoach in this next few years. I absolutely agree with you. There's this great group of people, and all of a sudden at 16, we want to treat them as growing up. I mean, goodness me, they've been having sex and smoking pot for years by that time. You know, what's different when they become 16, you know? So, you know, we do need to think differently about how we treat this group of people, and actually, we've got to look at ways of extending that. I totally agree with that. That's one of the big challenges that faces us. Some other big challenges, I'm, I'm, I'm over my time. We've got to develop commercial models for the future because in the age of austerity, right, we could be in government cuts. It looks like we're beginning to come out of this, but we're just pretending and extending as far as our debt is concerned. And we could actually be in a very austere fiscal situation for a very, very long time to come. And I think as bus managers, we've got to identify this and plan how can we become more and more commercial? If it means giving some kind of discount to these younger people, we keep them on our buses when they're 18, uh, from 16 to 23, then we need to do it, right? But we need to think, how do we keep the commercial model going? And that commercial model is going to be our saving grace going forward for the future. And I think that's absolutely fundamental. We can keep getting new products and do new things to do that. I think this, the second thing we've got to do is we've got to think, could we take... What costs could we still take out of this business? And 
But I've been asked to look forward to 2035. Good grief, there'll be 101 inventions. Twitter will be obsolete by that time, right? There'll be a, there'll a whole lot of other things have happened. But how are we going to, how could there be a development that would make a fundamental difference to what we do? And the answer is we get rid of the drivers. Now, you may laugh about that, but actually, we have the technology to do it just now with magnetic and optical guidance, right? The only problem is, what do you do in a house in this day when somebody throws a toy in front of a bus and the bus stops because the computer sees it and it stops? Then you've got to send somebody out to check if the lane's all right. Then you find that you maybe have to get the railway inspector involved. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> keep your drivers on the buses, okay? <laughs> but one day, we need to keep thinking about this because there are places where we could put these driverless units into place using the new technology. And we mustn't lose sight of it. That I know it's not going to be an Easter house, but there are some places <laughs> where you could do this, right? And we need to think where we might do this. That could illuminate the pathway forward because that's 60% of our cost. So we need to think smart about the longer term of future with the technologies that are changing all the time. And we've got to keep identifying these trends. And finally, I would say this. There are two things that drive our business. There are the mechanics of the business and there are the dynamics of the business. I believe at Stagecoach, we've got the balance right. We've got enough mechanics to understand the business, do the analysis that we need to do, get the results right, motivate our people, and all the rest of it. But we also have the dynamics of the business right. Dynamics are all about people. Mechanics are about budgets and all this stuff, right? Bores me rigid, and I, I just do what I want now. I don't bother with any of that stuff, right? <laughs> but the dynamics of the business are determined by the people. It's the ideas that you have, your relationship with people, you know, the motivational stuff, and how we can inspire people, right? And I believe that you have to get the dynamics of the business right to be a success. And actually, I believe the dynamics are more important than mechanics. We're a wee bit behind Go Ahead Group on the mechanics just now, but it's easily fixed. But the dynamics is the real fundamental key. Where's the ideas? Where's the vision? Where are you going to take it next? How could you do it differently? We bought Fife Scottish. There was four buses an hour to Fife to Edinburgh. Four buses an hour. Now there's 34 buses an hour. You stand to think about this. If you live in Cowden Beath, where do you want to go on a bus? The answer is anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can be out of cow and beef, right? That's where Interurban Express was born, right? How do we get these people? Retail changes. So why does our network not flex with it and change? Take people to the destinations they want to go to. And I will say one thing finally in this about Brighton and Hove, okay? You picked the easy company. <laughs> <laughs> because Quite, Bruce Sellers and Michael Sedgley had a cunning plan. Yeah. And the cunning plan was this. They created Brighton and Hove and bought it themselves. <laughs> they were very senior within NBC and they worked out it was one of five best companies in NBC. And then they created a company called Sedown, which was just a misnomer. <laughs> it was a collection of second-rate depots that was a ring round Brighton and Hove. And this was the plan. Brighton and Hove would prosper, and then Southdown would collapse, and they would just grow into the area of Southdown. <laughs> Seriously, that was the business plan, right? Stagecoach, we were stupid enough to take the Southdown company off the team of numpties who ended up with it. Right? <laughs> but let me just say this. Bus Group didn't get to where it is without 20 years of some not great decision making. And Southdown didn't get to where it is without 20 years of really good management. And Andrew Dyer is a fantastic manager. Absolutely. He has actually got the same growth in the dud company that you got in the good company. Mm -hmm. And I helped him to do it. <laughs> so give me the job. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, ladies and gentlemen, two inspirational but very varied and different uh, takes on, uh, on the theme this evening. Um, 
without too much further ado, I think we must stop no doubt there are many questions lurking and looming. I'm going to invite our three young courageous bus managers to open the batting. So we're Stephen, um, uh, Patrick and Ian. Um, gentlemen, you can see the lights of the eyes, so uh, feel free. And after about maybe five or ten minutes, the floor will be open. So please feel free also to share your questions. Thank you very much. Do we have a start? Good, mate. Yeah. Well done, Patrick. Well, thank you both for the fantastic presentations. Um, Thank you for the fantastic presentations. Um, our businesses would be nothing without people, customers, and our staff. Um, and Roger, you, well, I think you both mentioned that the, the way we communicate with customers is changing, and we still need to catch up with that. Um, you know, 15 years ago, it was probably just letter and phone, whereas now we've got letter, phone, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got you know people wanting to chat live on the web with us as well. Um, what more do we need to do to engage with customers and where do you think in 20 years time how do you think we're going to be communicating with customers then no uh, you go first okay. <laughs> <tongue power. laughs> that's what you said at the beginning i'd go first um i i, I well, I, I, it's difficult to know what we don't know is going to happen in, in terms of communication in, in the future, but you're right, it, it, there, there's going to be more and more communication. But I still come back to my theme that you've still got to get the basics right. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a complainer myself when it comes to dealing with other corporate businesses. I've currently got stuff on the go with BT, British Gas, EDF and uh, one or two train companies as well, because I like to test out the system just through letters, through emails, and through phone calls. And the rudeness in terms of not acknowledging, not getting back to customers is rife. And what worries me is if we're doing that with the basics, how are we gonna deal with it when the, the, it revs up as it is with emails and Twitters, etc. I, I used to pride myself that any letter that was written to Brighton and Hove, I'd reply the same day it came in and the customer would get it the next day. And they're, there was such a wow factor about that with the customer, they almost forgot the complaint that a managing director had replied to them the next day. When we went to email, I suddenly realized, I did it for a while, but after, when, once email got going, I realized I just couldn't do that. I couldn't justify the time, couldn't keep up with it. So I had to, to delegate that down. Once you then start delegating down the communication, and this is where I think Twitter is a huge challenge to the industry, because Twitter goes from one extreme of someone saying, why is my bus, why am I waiting Waiting at the bus stop now. Why isn't the bus coming? They'll tweet to the. What's your? Why is your policy on 19-year-olds so, um, so 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 uh, inconsiderate? And to get a person who can answer those two extremes, fundamental policy decisions, as well as de operational detail within the time frame that a customer expects it to come back, is a huge challenge. But I think we can do it. I, I, I do think that, and we've got to do it, because customers' expectations are there. And uh, I think that's where we can score as, a, as an industry against our colleagues in retail and, and these other utility-type companies who aren't doing a very good job at it I, I, at all. I think we can be impressive if we, get our, if we get our act together, get people motivated with it. All the stuff Brian was saying, I agree with as well. If we can get the... The, the staff motivated and feel they own the issues, then, then I think they will be able to respond. I think speed of response is going to become the key to communications in, 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 the, in the future. Getting the website, getting forums on the website, blogs, all these sorts of things. I, I just see that continuing. Well, I had the job, um, before I gave up as chief executive, I mean, I'm, this chairman job's fantastic, by the way. I do 7% of the work of what I did before, and I get 35% of the salary. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody offers you a job like this, take it as my advice. It's fantastic. But the first thing I handed over to the new chief executive, and I started handing stuff over last year, was we monitor Twitter and Facebook, right? And I used to hate reading it, because it's like horrible, the stuff that people are saying about your company. And you take it really personally, you know. You get really depressed reading all this. And the only way you can kind of lighten the burden is read first group's tweets. <laughs> <laughs> read, read National Express's tweets or whatever, right? I was reading National Express's tweets, and it said, travel on a National Express bus, some Roman suspension, woman two seats in front of me is breastfeeding her baby. Might as well give the kid a milkshake. <laughs> I can't repeat the rest of it. Um, but all of a sudden, 
you're omnipresent yeah and you can see all this and you can hear all this and it hits you you think this is awful we have to do something about it but the thing that comes to me and i now revert back to being a very old-fashioned bus man at this point most of the stuff that i read if the performance was right and the product was right and the policy was right that we're implementing at these companies I wouldn't be reading about it in the first place. So I still think that the first effort's got to go in to getting these boxes ticked, right? And then we've dealt with the real issues. When I used to be in the trade union, we used to go in the management and say, no wonder you've got trade union problems. Take, you give them a platform, you give the troublemakers a platform. And I come back to that with Twitter and Facebook. Don't give the troublemakers a platform do the job right in the first place and you'll not have to answer all the letters, right? Mm. I hate writing letters. I hate doing that stuff, right? I'd rather concentrate on getting the job right. Now, for, for then what you have to do with the residual, I absolutely agree. We need to get better at it and we need to understand how to do it. And the, you know the scary thing? See if we don't engage in this. Third parties are going to engage in our, engage and create businesses out of it and represent these people. There's a guy called Fix My Street. Mm. He's wanted to do Fix My Train Company. He's wanted to do Fix My Bus, right? Okay. And if you don't fix your bus, he's going to fix it. So the next one. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next uh, volunteer, please. Ian. Thanks. So just, um, sorry, just use my Roger, you were talking about, um, as part of your presentation, the, the quality aspect, and we, we looked at um, Arriva Sapphire, Stagecoach Gold, etc. Um, obviously, at the moment, there's a lot of talk within political circles about re-regulating um, bus services, um, quality contracts, that kind of thing. How do you think the bus industry is going to be in 20 years' time? Do you think we're going to see a return to more um, regulation again, or can we sustain the deregulated environment and prove to politicians that actually things like quality partnerships can deliver as well, if not better, than working in a regulated environment, which is more costly to, to provide. Well, well you go first this time. Yeah, because you, I, I don't know the intricacies of time and where, uh, Brian is. I, I would be just convinced it will end up in court and we will win. I'm sure we will win. He's right about that. Yeah. You're right about that. I, I think what we've got to demonstrate to people is that the age of, of dogma and ideology has passed in the last century. And that uh, working in partnership is the way to really create. And if you look at it, the list of demands that they have, all the valid ones can be done in a partnership. Just depends how extensive the partnership can be. I think there's another issue here. I think we are now, and I say we, I mean as a rail and a bus industry, now demonstrating that within the European context, we have actually, and I include London in this as well, as a country, we have actually delivered much better results in public transport than continental Europe has. And we've got higher growth rates and less cost for producing these products, right? And I actually think that we ought not to be embarrassed about this. I think we should be upfront about the advantages of the commercial model. Now, this is what's going to determine it. The availability of money under the fiscal you know, austerity. Now, I take some comfort from that because nobody's going to waste money on public transport when the health service is in crisis, right? It's never going to, we're never going to compete with them for funds. But the second thing that's going to determine it is we keep becoming more and more subsidy junkies in the regional bus companies. They, they give us concession schemes, right? And then they claim it's subsidy. Hey, just a minute, right? If the pensioner, if you're not paying for them, we'll just take the money off them, right? That's what we did before, right? So, you know, but every time somebody else gets supported, whether it's welfare to work or whatever, the percentage of hard cash on the bus comes lower and lower and lower. And the lower that number comes, the more difficult it is for us to argue for a commercial model. So there's a battle here. And we've got to make sure that we show that the commercial model can work. And we've got to make sure the percentage of full fare adults, right, keeps rising. That we've been obsessive about that stage, which with full fare adults. I chase my managers at the time. 
don't tell me about the pensioners. Tell me about the full fare adults. Are yeah. we getting them on the buses? And that's the key to remaining commercial. But I think that we there's been a lack of dialogue in some areas. I, 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 I no, have known Norman Baker for years, and before he came to the Department for Transport, he was a re-regulationist. But he saw the, the, the facts. He, he, once he got a taste of how the industry worked and he had responsibility, he changed his mind. And locally in Brighton and Hove, we've had Labour, Tory, Green councils. And once they have a level of responsibility, they, they can see the, the sense, as Brian says, in, in the fantastic model that we have in, in, in this country. I, I, I predict that, and it's starting now, in a number of rural areas, the concessionary fares are going to kill the service. It's happening in Cornwall, parts of North Yorkshire, because the local authority can't realises it gets a double saving. If it knocks the service off, it doesn't also then have to pay to reimburse the people who were travelling on it, if, they, if it's dominated by, by concessions. And I think that's going to lead to some uh, concession holders uh, being vociferous about the loss of, of their concession. And there's going to have to be a rethink about uh, how, how, how that goes in the future. I think we, we really have got to crack this young people um, situation because if we can do that, it takes away the thought of, of regulating that area to the extent, as Brian says, it would be subsidised. There, there is this sort of pent-up uh, political idea that we should have a concessionary scheme nationwide for, for young people, but we should be getting in there commercially and doing it before we, we allow that to be, an, to be an own goal. And we can do it with smart cards. That's the, the thing where you don't need to worry about whether they're wearing a moustache or not. If you get them to fill it in, put their date of birth, okay, you may get some fraudulent date of births, but you, then you can personalise the offer to them and not worry about their, their age and track it as they get older and older. So I think that, that's the potential for, for, for the future. But, I mean, I, I, no, I, I don't see the risk of re-regulation. The Labour Party said they would re-nationalise uh, the, the railways, uh, but they, 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 they didn't. And if they, Maria Eagles now moved on, I, I just can't conceive they would want to uh, re-nationalise the, the re-regulate or re-nationalise the industry. As Brian says, there isn't the money. Many local authorities are going to struggle to justify any money coming into public transport in the next few years, to, because they're going to have statutory requirements to get social services, health, and, and education going. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Thank you, um, Roger. You said that the operator glossy launches at a disconnect with the people. I was quite surprised about that because Brian stands on top of his buses and advertises them. <laughs> it, to me, it was a, a key way of showing non-users that you're invested in their service. Is it, isn't that important? Yeah, yes, it, it is. But I think we get carried away with it as, a, as an industry. Um, I, I mean, I... I I happen to believe that, that Stagecoach are a trailblazer. When I've gone round the country, you, you get the feel with Stagecoach, as Brian has said, the interurbans and the urban networks, they are good. There is no doubt they're good. So when they launch new buses on those networks, people think, yeah, that makes sense. But that doesn't apply elsewhere in other groups and in other parts of the country where people trumpet the fact that there's six single decks going into a fleet of about 100 and the service is crap, frankly. And, and, and the people in that town or city won't be impressed. The, the, the cheesy photograph in the local media will actually worsen the situation because there is this disconnect. You've got to get the quality of product right and the customers know that it's right. They, they're, they're not fools, they know, before you come in with these cheesy photographs saying how, how, how great it all is. Thank you. Um, one other thing I've picked up, um, the importance of young people travelling. Um, it made me remember some time back, was it the Oxford Tube let people with a young person rail card get a discount on the bus? That costs the industry nothing yeah. to administer. Has, have you ever thought of rolling that out a bit further? I think what we need to do is, we, we've got this ridiculous situation where we have a union rider ticket for people that are at university which of course is half the population these days. <laughs> <laughs> PhD stands for pizza home delivery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then we now penalise you if you're stupid. 
because you have to pay full fare at 16 and we get no other concessions. So to me, it's just nuts. And I said this to Martin, you know, I think we need to come up, we just extend Unirider to everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, right? And I think there's, that we've definitely got to get more young people engaged. In it. And yeah, that that was successful. But I think the other thing, I, I would back what Roger said, is, you know, with near, with near field signalling now live and with us, um, I still think the phone's going to be there for a long yeah, time to come. Yeah. Like me answering the phones in central SMT. The phones are still the trick here because with near field signaling, you can have everything inside your phone and you can have all that yeah. stuff you're talking about, yeah. all your identity and everything. So mm. all you need to do is pass your phone over it. And, and quite honestly, smart cards is old technology yeah. right? and barcodes is last century. Right? And, and I, at Stagecoach, I've kind of encouraged us. I, I'd really like to see us doing and I know Martin will be better at this than me because he's much brainier than I am and he's be better chance of him implementing it, is to try to jump a technology the next time round and go one step ahead the next time instead of being two steps behind, which is where we are just now. And I think there's a lot of mileage in that with, with, with young people and, getting, and, and back to this commercial thing, that's a group we need to keep on the bus. The, 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 we, we need to do that and not use someone else's loyalty card because we want to know who our customers are, how often they're traveling, where they're traveling. We've got that golden opportunity to do that. So if we can get them to use some app on their smartphone or some other piece of plastic that we know it's theirs, the, the world is our oyster in terms of encouraging them to travel. Whereas if we rely on their young person's rail card, we don't know who they are again. They've gone anonymously into the cash type of transaction. We've got to get into this personal marketing way of doing things. It's hard to get traction under some of this stuff though. I mean, I, I'm really up for it, but yeah. it's hard to get it traction is. under it. That's why we need the young guys, and we'll be the old farts just saying, you've got to do it, you see? We just come and say, you've got to do it. Oh, yeah, 50% right with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, can I, if I may, thank uh, these, uh, these uh, bright young things for their contribution today. Um, I think they've um, asked some really probing questions and got some really valid and uh, thought-provoking responses. So, uh, Stephen and um, Pat and Ian, thank you very much indeed, guys. Well done. Hope you got your CV. <laughs> so, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, can, uh, we can unleash the gates and uh, ask um, questions, please, from the floor. Yes, if you kind of just to explain who you are and who you work for, and then please feel free to ask a question. So just on, on, the, on the other thanks. Uh, uh, Peter Gordon, I'm the London Regional uh, tre uh, Treasurer for the MCILT. Um, uh, it's interesting, one of the changes you haven't mentioned has been, uh, so to talk about the car, the fact I think about half the youngsters aren't learning to drive, not just don't have cars, but don't, aren't learning to drive. Is that something that, some, uh, that's something to do with reason that people are trying to buy a bus? And is that being reflected um, in, in the marketing? Will it extend to people actually taking buses, bu to, to, if you like, government taking buses more seriously? It's interesting, if rail fares go up, it's always in the news. Petrol price is going to go up, tax goes up, it's always in the news. No one ever seems to mention a bus. It always seems to be the, uh, the, 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 for the forgotten uh, industry. And if I may have a, have a second question. You mentioned the danger about uh, bus subsidies not being able to afford them. Now, Brian, you're also the chairman of, um, of a franchise, I think you own 49% of another franchise with a, with a fairly flamboyant uh, guy also, also in charge. We know that rail subsidies are really going up sort of £5 uh, billion pounds a year. Obviously, a lot of that is infrastructure. Do you think, uh, A, c c c can your rail, your rail uh, franchises, can the government afford them? And what about maybe a bit less being spent on rail um, uh, franchises, uh, rail subsidies, and more being spent on bus subsidies? What effect would that have? Well, I may or may not believe that myself, but that's it, my question. It, it would be far better value for the taxpayer, but there is an issue around rail. Uh, no politician in their right mind will ever agree for a railway to be converted to a guided busway. And there's about 20 candidates around the country that would be first-class conversions. It doesn't matter how bold they are, you'll never ever get their support for it. Somebody once said that that the English treat the railways the same way as they do their cathedrals. They really must have them, but they don't really <laughs> use them very often. And there's, there's an element about that in middle class, embodied in middle class thinking. So it's never ever going to change. Here's the problem on the railway and why the number is much bigger than it should be. Um, the railway is in a, a ridiculous situation. 
When the asset was privatised, network rail I'm talking about, it went for four billion sterling. It's had incredible amounts spent on it. It's now booked at 45 billion. Now, Network Rail has to pay the interest on the bonds that fund that because it's a commercial inverted commas organisation, right? What do you think the real value of the RAB is? I'll put a, get, I'll put a number on it for you, right? I'll put a Brian Stuter number on it, right? I think it's worth 12 in a good day. I think if you put the whole lot up for sale, you'd be lucky if you got eight or nine billion for the RAB assets. What happened to the rest of it? So there's some phony, phony economics around this. And if anybody had the courage, and no politician in, in Britain has the courage, right? If they were willing to take a right off on the RAB once and for all, right? And then reset the bar on the railway and say that was the price of Hatfield, okay? We actually have got one of the most efficient railways in Europe. But as long as we've got this crazy stuff, and all the stuff that's been built up around the network rail structure, right? We're never going to get to the promised land. And it needs to be some very radical thinking by politicians. On to the buses. Key issue here for us, you're absolutely right. There's a whole lot of people not driving. That's partly because the insurance is such a ridiculous price. Back to my friend's point here, we need to get these young people on the buses and keep them on the buses. But also there's an environmental aspect to this about society attitudes so it's a mixture of a combination of price and and ethical issues about the environment and that's a sweet place we're in as bus companies a really sweet place but this is what we did at stagecoach to deal with this we think the mega rider ticket has got to be affordable and save you money on your car right and some of the weekly tickets are ridiculous prices around the regions right the measure of the mega rider ticket is that if you buy it, you're saving money, not just on your parking costs, but on your petrol costs. And that has been one of the key issues for us to grow our regional networks in places where there's not so much modal shift and where pricing is much more important, like in the Midlands and the north of England. And I think you've got to really understand your business and put the right pricing in, as well as the right performance and the right product and the right policy. You've also got to get the pricing right as well. Thank you very much. Excellent. Next question, please. Mr. Freeman, sir. Very simple one. Um, is the mayor of Liverpool the only one like himself? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a supplementary, what do we do about him? <laughs> I, I don't know enough about the relationships in Liverpool to know whether the the, the Mr. Bus, the Mr. Arriva, the Mr. Stagecoach, the Mr. Whoever else runs buses in Liverpool can honestly say they saw it coming and they did enough before that decision was made by that man. I, I seriously don't know. But I personally would have been aghast if we'd got a directly elected mayor in Brighton and Hove, which actually was one of my unsuccessful initiatives that I campaigned for at, at one point ten years ago if they had been taken up their post and had, had done this, I would have regarded myself as having totally and utterly failed as a bus manager, as a senior mover and shaker in the area I was running buses. And I, I, if I was a group leader in those groups, I would be asking serious questions of my managing directors about how often they'd met the man, how they'd talked about buses and whatever. But I, I may be being unfair, because I don't know whether he's a complete nutcase and, and, and is un, un, unable to be reasoned about, about, about these things. But I do, I, what I do know from my experience is that bus company managing directors should have local opinion on their side. They should be working with the media. They should be, I, I feel quite passionately, that we, we just score our own goals by not being proactive enough in talking up the bus and, and getting this personality of the bus company in each local area at the right status at the right level, which is what I was referring to earlier. So I, I, I don't know the detail of how this has come about in Liverpool, if he is a complete maverick. But what I would say is generally, other than Tyne and Weir and Liverpool, generally speaking, 
public transport can rise above local politics if it's dealt with properly. Look at London. We had Ken and Boris both are both campaigning for high profile for buses, completely different opposite ends of the spectrum. We've had the same in Brighton. The Tories, the Greens, the Labour, seeing the value of local buses. I think on this Liverpool thing, I don't know the details either, but in some of the north of England cities, <coughs> congestion is not an enormous problem. And what happens is people paint lines on wide roads and then slap themselves in the back that they've done a great job putting in bus lanes. What they never do is deal with the congestion nodes where the paper shops are sat on the trunk bits of the road. We all know that, right? And that's actually where all the problems happen. So if you've got quite wide streets, and, and there are bits of Liverpool where they've got these kind of 1930s boulevards or whatever, right? It's easy to create bus lanes. Actually, it's not making such an enormous difference in some places because they don't deal with the congestion nodes. <coughs> but if you're in a car, you just feel like the road space isn't very fairly allocated. I'm going to be really unpopular saying this. Don't underestimate the power of the car lobby. I'm totally on site for this, and I totally agree with everything Roger says. I'll tell you, I was really surprised. In Scotland, the SNP, the first thing they did in the 2007 administration was abandon the tolls on the fourth bridge. It was just, to me, it was complete madness. It was only 40 pence. It should have been about £2.40, pence, right? OK? And you know this, it was one of the most popular things that they did in the whole time they were there. And I think one of the reasons they went back in a landslide in 2011 was partly because of that and the froze the rates. It just got a feel-good factor for motorists. And I tell you, we've got to understand this. We've got to get intelligent car use. And we've got to get the motorist on side with us. And, you know, we're never going to get Jeremy Clarkson on side because he's a... Is a complete Luddite, but there might be some other people we can get inside, and I think intelligent car use is the key to us. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, and also, the gentleman at the front here, John, and then I've got the gentleman there, the gentleman in case I've forgotten this. It's uh, John Cartledge from London Travel Watch. In very general terms, over the last 15 years or so, taking one year from another, bus patronage in the metropolitan areas of Britain other than London has been in continuous decline. Bus patronage in the Shire counties has been broadly flatlined and bus patronage in London has been climbing steadily to the point where London now accounts for more than half of all bus journeys made in Britain every year. Is this simply a function of London having unique geography and demography or is there else something else that uniquely London is getting right that the rest of the industry needs to learn from. It's a can of worms. Well, <laughs> well I'm quite happy to go. I, yeah, we both can, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm quite I'm happy. Real to go. hobby horse. Yeah, I'm quite happy to go first on that. Um, I mean, it's very interesting. But we, we bought into London companies before they started uh, the big increases in uh, timetables and doubling frequencies and putting all the extras in, and um, you're. You encapsulated in the question one of the fundamentals of it, which is that the demography and geography of it is quite different with a big heavy rail coming in to London. And we had 2 to 3% organic growth, which I remember very well because there were net contracts, and I rather liked that aspect of the London market at that time. Um, and if we did a good job, you were getting that growth. And it kind of came as a kind of a natural growth. Then when we went to putting all the frequencies up, uh, we clearly got, got very, very high growth, right? I would say, though, if you draw a line from the Bristol Channel to the Wash, I can take you to <coughs> 10 companies in that geography that have actually grown as fast as London, and they've done it on the commercial model. So I would make that argument back. Now, what really knackers, I think, is that the Shire counties, we haven't had that in the stagecoach companies because we've got Interurban Express. And Interurban Express has been a great thing for us, right? Um, the metropolitan counties is simply because they've not got the right policies. I mean, there's about two parking rides in the metropolitan areas, right? All the stuff that's worked everywhere else, 
they have not done and they always want to blame the bus company now i'm not going to i'm not going to say that there haven't been places where the bus companies have under delivered in the metropolitan areas i would fully accept that there are some cases of that but we've had fantastic growth in south manchester i've, I've published all these numbers we've had amazing growth in south manchester the problem is the burn rate in some of the bad places has been shockingly bad. The, these passengers could easily get back on the buses. We did it in Barnsley. We got, we got through the market 20 or 30 percent. My people were suggesting this is organic growth we're getting in Barnsley. No, it's not. It's just the people that Yorkshire Attraction burnt off by running the timetables that they had in 1982 and 2006 and messing up the services. And fixing it just got the people back on the buses. So I think it's a complex answer, mm -hmm. but I think it's a complex issue. I, I agree, and I, I, amongst the places that I was in fairly recently was Rochdale, and I thought I'd take a wander from the Metrolink current terminus to see where it's being extended to. And I honestly thought they, they must have had early closing in the afternoon because all, all the shops had shutters down. And then I realised, no, this is normal. The, the, there is just no economic activity of m much going on in that part of Manchester. So no wonder there's not much need to travel compared to, say, parts of London where the economy is just booming now, even now and population growth. There's some statistic, is it Leicester or something, that London's grown to the extent of a Leicester over the last 10 years and is set to have a Leeds in the next 10 years. So. If the w and, of course, Boris has brought the free travel down to 60, there's free travel for youngsters. Well, blimey, if London wasn't growing passengers with these sorts of things going on, there's something seriously wrong. You only have to put a bus out and people will just clamber aboard. There's no marketing in London of any sense. There's no customer service. They don't have to. In fact, they're appalling, some of the TfL aspects of customer service and marketing. It's all operationally led. I, 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 well, I won't. I, you really get me on a hobby horse about, about London and, and how it is an operational-led company compared to in the Nottinghams, the Cambridges, the Oxfords, the Exeters. The, as Brian says, you, you look at the uh, unitaries, typically the unitaries and the interurbans in the area south of, as Brian's absolutely right, Bristol to the Wash, and th the bus networks are thriving. Thank you. I, I can feel the blood pressure rising. <laughs> on you. Uh, thank you for the question. I've got time for two more questions, actually, if that's okay. General on the left there, then General in front. Thanks. Richard Pound. Um, I come tonight, I think, as a lobbyist who started lobbying at the age of 17 in southwest Birmingham as the youngest member of the Wheelie Castle Passengers Action Committee because we had such a crap bus service at that time in some areas. But I've carried on doing quite a bit of lobbying over the years. Um, to answer John's point, one of the reasons that my car is parked outside my house is that I've got a red bus W7 operated by Metro Line, which runs every four minutes at the peak. And when I go home, I will have the same red type of red bus on the same route number, but OK, it's operating every 10 minutes. But that is because, for all their faults, and TFL has a lot, and Pete and is not here tonight, um, they, they provide a basic standard of service and it's timetabled. Uh, but anyway, my serious question takes you back to your two presentations, gentlemen, and you're talking about innovation. And the question came from, I think, the gentleman, the young manager on the far side whose name I, I forget, about quality contracts and the time and where issue. Now, that is where quality contracts started. With go ahead on the south side of the Tyne, contracting to Tyne and Weir busways to provide their services in Gateshead. Compare it with West Midlands, for example, when Midland Red just sold out and said, We don't want to play ball, buy it off us, and four, 430 buses and a few depots transferred. Now, Brian, you have been accused, and I think there have been comments, oh, we'll take our bus, if this goes through, we'll take our buses away, which I think is 
not a very good reaction. In fact, there's been some very strong criticism to that. Oh, he's throwing his toys out the pram. But seriously, it is innovation because they want to see some restoration of integration. I had cause to visit Gateshead a lot in the early 80s. 400 yard walk to the old Durham Road, five bus routes coming down, yellow bus, transfer ticket, and into Newcastle in a very short period of time. Integration is a very, very important issue. And unfortunately, in the present situation, it's not on your agenda. That's what I think that Tyneside want. Now, if you can't do it in a quality partnership, then they're only going to push you into a quality contract. Why do you dislike it, or why do you want to walk away from it? Well, I think you've misunderstood our position on this. We are very happy to give integrated ticketing. In fact, our IT people have delivered it in a number of other metropolitan areas where they've worked with the PTE people. So what you have said is the problem is not the problem. And what you're saying you would like to see delivered as a passenger, we would support and applaud, and it can easily be done within a quality partnership. There is no issue around that whatsoever. I'll just put on the record clearly what I wanted them to understand in Tyne and Weir. There is, for me, an integrity issue in this. And this is the integrity issue. They sold the bus companies to us in the first place, knowing what the system was. They took the money off us. We bought it in good faith. We have invested in it every year. We have, I think, had one day's or two days industrial stoppage in the whatever two decades that we've been running it, which I think is remarkable, right? So we clearly don't have industrial relations problems. We, we have lobbied them all along to put park and ride in. We've gone in with guided busways ideas for them, right? We are dealing with a bunch of unreconstructed Stalinists who, want, who are completely driven by political dogma. And that's why I'm so hard on this, right? Because they are not going to nationalise my business that I bought them in good faith and take 60 buses a year off me for the next eight years at their leisure. The first contract that they put out on my business I'm out of town and we're completely, and they can buy 500 buses and find four bus depots. And when they do that, they'll find that actually what I'm delivering with my 500 buses and my four bus depots and my fantastic workforce is actually very good value for money. Because when they price it properly, they will realize what the real cost of a quality contract is. And that's why I'm so hard on the issue. Because unless you're prepared to be as robust as that, Okay, then you'll have your business taking off you incrementally and they'll pick the bits that they want out of your business and you'll be left with a carcass and I'm no waiting around for eight years to watch it happen. But Thank you. Went back Thank to sorry. East London. Sorry, I think we're gonna have to stop. I went back to East London. Yes. Of course I did. I've sold the company for two hundred and sixty five million, I bought it back for fifty three <laughs> <laughs> income <laughs> damn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would just add that as we speak now, there is a passenger standing on the Cowley Road in Oxford with an integrated smart card Can that I? will catch the first bus that comes Can along, I? whether it's one of stagecoaches or go-aheads, and the revenue is shared in an equitable manner and depending the on the use. The roof. Yes, absolutely. So if, if the good burgers of Tyne and Weir were to only overcome their political dogma and look at some examples in the south of England, they, don't they want can to hear have it. all they want. They don't want to hear it. They don't well, want to I hear it. to be it. fair, we've, we've had a, a suitably impassioned response to what was a thought-provoking <laughs> and controversial question, which I thank you. Um, I did promise one more question, if I may. Gentleman front here, sir. If you'll come some, that's okay. And then uh, we're just going to go to the next part of the evening's entertainment, which is our vote. <laughs> Business. I'm Peter Hull, I'm just a private member of the Institute. Um, you were speaking earlier on about the comparisons with things like people like Marks and Spencer's McDonald's and the work they do to market themselves. 
And although there have been some improvements over the years, it still strikes me that on a Sunday, for example, which is now a major recreational day, the lack of a Sunday service on many routes doesn't do the bus, uh, bus industry much good because the people want to go out on a Sunday, and yet you see the vast reduction in, uh, not so much in London, of course, but in the provinces of the Sunday timetable. And I wonder whether thoughts being given in terms of the marketing side to improving this. I agree with you, and if these young men were to offer me a job, that would be one of the first things actually I would look at, the Sunday level of service compared to weekday, and not only that, but evenings as well. Far too many bus timetables on uh, intensive frequencies and uh, interurbans pack up at about 6, 6.30 and 7 or go on to hourly. No wonder people think, oh, I better take the car because you're going to be stranded in the town. I think you're absolutely right. I, I feel very strongly on that point. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, first things first, uh, can I <coughs> sincerely thank our two uh, illustrious speakers for uh, truly inspirational and thought-provoking uh, angles of attack and reflection on the industry, both past, present, and future. I'm going to be slightly self-indulgent for a gentleman. I've got one more last question to ask, if I may. I was fortunate this year to be invited by Mr. John Lennon, who's here today, to become a, um, a judge, UK Bus Awards. And one of the categories which I was um, um, unleashed upon was the Young Bus Managers Awards. One of the questions I actually asked were, if you could pick three words that you think are most important to your career and future, what three words would they be? And in fairness, most of them didn't really have a reply, one gentleman in particular who, after a long pregnant pause, just said three words. I said three words. He said, "More money, please." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I won't say which organisation it came from. But if I'd ask you the same thing, three words which you think would be a legacy from your past experiences and your knowledge from anybody entering industry in the future. Um, I think I said it at the end before I remind myself. I would say uh, dedication, innovative, and passion. Thank you. And survive. Yeah, definitely passion. Got to be passionate. Um, I think innovation would be the, the second word. And um, I think detail might be the third word, actually. There you have it. From the horse's mouth to the mouth. I think anybody who's actually aspiring to join this industry, uh, those six words are certainly very important. Now, here comes the fun bit. You'll have one of these, ladies and gentlemen. On the one side it says retired, hence the slippers. On this side it says hired. So what I'm going to do is put uh, Daniel and uh, maybe Emma, if you don't mind, covering that side of the auditorium. Um, I'm going to first of all say, just, I don't know if it's, uh, that Roger went first, so I think we'll put Sublime first, OK? So what you have to do is, when I say the name of the prospective client, you have to stand up and actually show which of the two sides of the card you think is appropriate, OK? So, uh, Sir Brian Souter, who'd like him hired and who'd like him retired, please? If you show me one. <laughs> <laughs> so, just stand up, please, if you don't mind. I think it might be a bit easier. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just bear with us whilst we, uh, we do the maths. Looks like you've got a job, Brian. I notice one or two abstinations there. That's uh, very critical. Well done. <laughs> you can't change your mind, by the way. Okay, okay, councillors, Mr. Kedani. Now, um, I know you said Sir Roger French there. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, you never know. So those votes, I'm please, please for, for Mr. Roger French. <laughs> Stand up again, please. It's, it's closer than you think. Yeah, very close. Your, your I'm, I'm hiring him, I thought he was great. <laughs> Okay, just you should have brought Brian and Hove and not Sam. How are you doing? You okay? <laughs> okay, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, we managed to stop um, you buying bright and blue glasses as well. So, yeah. perhaps I can, I can yeah. ask Daniel to yeah. talk Dick Clark uh, <laughs> when I heard you've been down. Whilst we uh, be confer, as they say. <laughs> I think you're the other way. So, first things first, um, may I thank you all very much indeed uh, for, for uh, participating and just a little bit of fun, really, at the end of the day. Um, 
What we're going to do now is when the vote's counted is uh, we've got a couple of just um, gimmicks, frankly, gone the better word. Um, in these austere times, I'm sure you'd appreciate the good old days of CILT when you could afford to buy all sorts of nice uh, medals and all sorts of good things. But these days, no, not the same anymore, unfortunately. So what we have now is we have, first things first, do we have a winner? Well, after verification yes. and adjudication, it is um, a dead heat. Oh, no. <laughs> In all things, considering the law of averages, um, I would have two choices here. One, give a cast and vote, or I think we should go with the flow and accept it as a dead heat. Fair? I would like to then congratulate Sir Brian and Roger in their firing <laughs> <laughs> for their new role here. as consultants. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this is slightly thrown us out of kilter here because um, we have two presents for you actually. Um, if you actually open up, you'll see there's a little mug there, and uh, there's a little bottle of something rather which very good. Of interest. Um, suffice to say that if, if you actually see what's happening in the middle of the it might actually sort of explain to you. <laughs> but the loser, we actually also had a second vote. <laughs> 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 well, when you do eventually <laughs> retire. <laughs> to, uh, so we some slippers. Well, so I'll eat them. And the point? Enjoy their retired hide status. Um, but that kind of leads us to the conclusion of the evening, I think, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've had, I think, a, a, an excellent, an excellent um, opportunity to, to listen to two really first-class presentations and some really stimulating questions uh, and some good, youthful questions as well, for which I thank you. There are some compulsory thank yous I, I feel compelled to make. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sir Brian Souter and Roger French. Well done. Thank you. In his absence today, although he did very much want to be here, uh, Sir Peter Hendy, um, I'd like to thank him for allowing us to use this what I think is an excellent auditorium, and we've been well looked after, and I thank everybody here for that, and the TV crew, of course. Um, I also need to thank David Brown at Go Ahead, and uh, Martin, the stagecoach, for helping us sponsor this evening, uh, which is very much appreciated indeed. I'd like to thank from the Institute of Transport Logistics, Mr. Steve Ag, Chief Executive, uh, Daniel Parker Klein, um, also Lee White, of course, Emma, Another key member was John Carr. Thank you very much indeed for your support over the last two years since we started and embarked on our adventure with the Bus and Coach Forum. Um, so that more or less, I think, leads me to conclude tonight's um, event. I'd like to thank you all again for uh, supporting us. I think it's been a, a really pleasant, enriching and enjoyable occasion. And we look forward to the maybe to see you again next year when we host our third event. So just outside now, we have, um, we have wine, we have, uh, I think, some light refreshments. So please go mingle, debate, and uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you all.